Welcome to this episode of the Greater Phoenix Chambers podcast, Let's Talk Business Phoenix, with me, your host, Todd Sanders, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber. In each episode, we tackle important issues and subjects affecting our businesses, our community, and the state today. Through relevant, timely topics, this podcast serves as the business community's voice with the mission of championing business growth, identifying problems that restrict economic development, and conveying community leaders to move Phoenix forward. Let's Talk Business Phoenix was produced in partnership with Ideas Collide, an agency offering a full suite of custom marketing solutions for your brand's unique challenges. Make a connection at ideascollide.com. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, Today, we're honored to have Leslie Myers, who is the Associate uh, General Manager for Water Resources at SRP. Uh, Welcome. We're, We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. Well, we want to get started with knowing a little bit more about you. You've obviously been involved in water for a long time um, at the national level, um, but tell us a little, little bit more about you. Great. Thanks, Todd. And thanks for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I actually came to Arizona right out of college um, looking for good, solid work as an engineer. Uh, my husband and I both started working um in the late 80s here in design of roadways because that was what was happening in Arizona at the time and they needed lots of engineers. Uh, I did that for about a year and then I transitioned to the Bureau of Reclamation uh, right at during the construction of the Central Arizona Project. So I spent 34 years there, uh, great years. I retired last summer and came to SRP. Well, we're thrilled that you're at SRP, and we've uh, I got to meet you last year. I think when you were j- just starting, um, something about your about yourself that we wouldn't know uh, from your bio. Oh, great! So uh, I I started this story and then decided to hold it okay. for, for this piece. But I, actually, when I first came to Reclamation, um, I was a construction inspector on the Central Arizona project. I uh, did inspection out in the pump jettering plant at Waddell Dam and actually on the dam itself. Uh, So I started in operations, which was fantastic, and it really laid the groundwork from then on. So I've always had uh, water resources and CAP and now SRP in my blood. That's excellent. Well, so then when you were here, though, when you first got here, did I-17 connect or I-10 connect all the way through? I tend to not connect through okay. when we first came through Phoenix. Yeah. Yes. So you've seen a lot of a lot of change here. A lot of change and a lot of growth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're definitely a place where people want to come, but that impacts sort of the topic for today, which is of course water. It does. And it actually, you know, if we think about it, the fact that we have water and a, a reliable water supply from the Salt River project and the Central Arizona project is what has allowed the Phoenix metropolitan area to grow to be the fifth largest city in the country. Well, for, for folks who may not be aware, how did, you know, when you think about Central Arizona Project, obviously that's how we get the water here from the, from the um, Colorado River, yes. but how did that come about? <laughs> well, um, it, you know, all of the projects uh, that developed water here have, have been Bureau of Reclamation projects. So, uh, in the early 1900s, when the reclamation was authorized by Teddy Roosevelt in 1902, Salt River Project was one of the original five projects authorized. Um, so we always say that was one of the first reclamation projects. And ironically, the Central Arizona Project was one of the last authorized reclamation projects. It, and it was authorized in 1968. Um, so it, it started planning in the 40s. Uh, it was authorized in the 60s. It was constructed in the 70s and 80s, and it started delivering water in the late 80s. And it was a congressional deal. And my understanding is that part of the deal for to include Arizona was that we're that we're last in and first out in terms of water usage. Or it rights. is right. So there was a really long-standing disagreement about how the Colorado River was allocated uh, in the lower basin among the basin states, California, Nevada, and Arizona. And Arizona really didn't buy into the methodology early on. And uh, so later there was a lot of discord between California and Arizona. And eventually there was a Supreme Court case, Arizona v. California, um, and that said, okay, Arizona, you are entitled to certain things, but right after that, we had to get the project authorized, and California remembered, and remembered hard, and they have the big congressional delegation, so we got the authorization, but 
but the hook was that um, the, anything that was developed, any contracts that were established after that date in 1968 had the lowest priority, and that's primarily the Central Arizona Project. What a fascinating history for our state. Yes, it is. And, and I think a good lesson that you know, policy can have very long range impacts. Yes, it is. I, I think it's you always have to be careful um, because people have and states and other organizations have very long memories. Um, and water is just a very um, hot topic and very important. Well, and I think that's such an important point you make because, at, you know, in my time here um, in Arizona, uh, it, it hasn't always been. It, it's sort of we've always just had water uh, and all of a sudden it's become hot. How did we get here in terms of the, the water shortage we're in today? Well, I, I think the bottom line is that we uh, were suffering from climate change and, and really climate variability. So the allocations of the Colorado River, um, the same with the Salt River Project, are based on hydrology uh, from the early 1900s. And what we've seen, of course, over time is that the climate is so much more variable. So we're having higher highs, lower lows, and just this really significant long-term period of drought. So we might have a couple of good years, but overall, we can't, those couple of good years aren't enough to get us back to normal. Okay. Um, and I guess to that point, we just got declared a, a, a tier, tier two uh, shortage. Yes. Talk to us about what does that mean? What's the impact on, on Arizona businesses? So the tier two shortage comes from, um, I, and ironically, I'll say in the early 2000s uh, or in the year 2000, the Colorado River system was full and we were in good shape at the time. The Salt River Project was struggling. But when that happened, um, we actually, the, the Colorado River Basin states and the federal government negotiated surplus guidelines on the Colorado River first. It wasn't until later in the 2004, 2005 timeframe that we got around to talking about shortage sharing guidelines. And those guidelines were actually implemented in 2007. And the premise of the guidelines really were coordinated operations between the upper basin, which is at the base of uh, Glen Canyon Dam or Lake Powell, and the lower basin, which starts at Lake Mead or Hoover Dam. And um, the lower basin shortages are based on the elevation in Lake Mead. So as the elevation drops, uh, entities, the states have to take reductions, right, to, to try to slow down the decline of Lake Mead. Well, before we even had a chance to implement those 2007 shortage sharing guidelines, um, the, the modeling and the data said it's not enough. What we negotiated there as far as reductions uh, to deliveries was not going to uh, alleviate enough risk. And so in the mid 2010s, there was a whole nother overlay that's called the drought contingency plan Correct. to the original 2007 guidelines. And that overlay then has these tiers, meaning we increased the amount of reductions. We also drew in California um, because there was significant risk to them. So now there's reductions through that, through the DCP to Arizona, Nevada, California, and then through a separate set of agreements with Mexico. Um, so it, we got all the way to 2022 before we had to implement any of those shortage guidelines. Uh, and the first one was a tier one, which meant we, we met the first elevation. And then tier 2A um, is in 2023. And what it means is, is there's pretty significant reductions to Arizona, about 600,000 acre feet, 592, which is about... 20 to 25 percent, let's say, of Arizona's Colorado River allocation. So, so really significant. It is. It's very significant. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, because we talked about this, that CAP has the lowest priority or a, a group of folks in that fourth priority. But primarily those reductions come to the Central Arizona project. And the aforementioned California really doesn't have to do much at this point. Not at this point. Okay. So 
Um, you know, thinking about what we've done, and clearly there's been a lot of work, and, and sure it's not been in the media, but it's been in the background. Do you feel like we've done a good job in preparing and ensuring that we're doing what we can to to save water and to bank water? So we actually, um, there's millions, probably nine million acre feet. And when we talk about an acre foot, that if you if you envision an acre of land, which is about the size of a football field, uh, about a foot deep of water, that's an acre foot. So it's okay. a pretty significant amount of water, 325,000 gallons. Um, it is the nomenclature, but I, I know it's not uh, completely intuitive what it is. So when we're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of acre feet of water, it's a, it's a lot of water. Uh, so um, when, the, when the Central Arizona project first came online, uh, we weren't fully using all of our water supply. And so some of the water was staying on the river. And because the way that uh, water works in a year is every year starts new, there's a, a amount of water in the lower basin available. And if Arizona didn't use its allocation, it, it tiered down in priority to the next user. So for many years, California was using our extra water. Um, and that wasn't necessarily acceptable to Arizona. They wanted to be able to import and use all of our own water supply. So we established the water bank and we started bringing water into Arizona and storing it underground. And the premise of it was, was that we would use it in times of shortage, right? We would firm ourselves in times of shortage. So uh, we have a lot of water stored here in Arizona. So um, our version of the strategic petroleum reserve, but with water. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. And so do you feel like that that sets us up um, in, a, in a better place than some of our neighboring states? It does. I think it's, I think it's good. Uh, I think w one of the issues is now we did such a great job of, of establishing that water bank and creating long-term storage credits and putting together the institution. Today, now we have to figure out how to recover it, move it around and, and use it. Okay. Um, so, so we're not, um, we haven't maybe mastered that, but we're working on it. We're in the process of working on that. So we've had, I think, the benefit of a really nice wet winter and a lot of snow up north. And I think a lot of people are sort of hoping, well, maybe that's going to have an impact. I think we all know that that's not going to solve the problem. But what kind of impact will that have in this for just this season? Mm -hmm. So for the Salt River Project, which is all interior to Arizona, and the nice thing about the Salt River Project is where one entity, one watershed, you know, the Colorado River is seven basin states in Mexico. So we have a lot more control um, over that system, but our series of reservoirs will fill this year and, and we'll be back to a full status, which is great, a great place to be. Now we have a limited area that, that have uh, rights to Salt River Project water. And we're doing some projects that are going to allow us to develop additional supply and move that water outside Horseshoe of our Dam, own I believe. surface area. So yes, we have, we have a couple of things in the queue. Uh, we're looking at um, modifying Bartlett Dam on the Verde River that will allow us, right, right now we have, um, we don't have a lot of capacity on the Verde. And so we, uh, don't have the ability to really control and moderate the water there like we do on the Salt River. And so we're looking at modifying Bartlett Dam and potentially constructing a whole new Bartlett Dam that will give us a lot more storage and capability and flexibility and reliability on the Verde uh, again. And that water is in addition to the initial established Salt River Project water and water service area. So that water will be able to move mm -hmm outside of our project and help support central Arizona. We're also looking at in the short term, um, uh, the ability to um, do planned uh, reoperation of the flood control space at Roosevelt, which would let us at the end of a season, release the water slower if it gets into the flood control space and be able to, so we can use it instead of just putting it in the river and letting it flow. Let it um, so that's a short term, that's immediate. And then the other big project that we're looking at is when the Central Arizona project was constructed, there was a CAP SRP interconnect. So we could deliver water back then, 
lots of water in the Central Arizona project, more need potentially in the Salt River project, and more flexibility. So we can actually deliver water, CAP water, to the Salt River project for, for delivery. Today, we want to connect the other way now so that we can move this water through the Central Arizona project and, and support other communities. Because the, the Verde system is so healthy now. The Verde system is extremely healthy this year. Yeah, that, is, that is tremendous. And the, the, the idea that we would not really lose that um, yes. with this interconnectivity sounds like a, a real win for um, the rest of the state as well. It is. It is. It gives us just a lot of operational flexibility. And really, it's, you know, we have the water supplies that we have. We're going to have really banner years and, and not so banner years. And this the ability to be flexible like this um, just gives us all the tools back in the toolbox. So if looking at sort of the West, uh, too early to pop any champagne corks, this is really, <laughs> it's a great winter, but, but we've got a, a long way to go is what I'm hearing we from do. you. We uh, do, even it's it's been good. We've had a very productive year on the mm-hmm. Colorado River watershed too. Um, that one, is going to take longer to recover. Okay. Speaking of that, we understand that we could have a, a tier three in 23 or 24, obviously, give or take, depending on what, what we're seeing. Can you speak to that? Those are some pretty significant reductions. And um, I would say uh, that, you know, that is the the most significant reductions per the drought contingency plan that was negotiated. Also, uh, last June, the commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation said, you know, we've run some models and what we have, what we've negotiated isn't enough. And we probably always knew that, but it was the best that we could do at the time for a consensus approach. And so the uh, commissioner said, we need to seriously look at more significant reductions than that. So the reductions, if there's seven and a half million acre feet for delivery in the lower basin, um, we need to reduce that drought contingency plan reduces that by about one, 1. 1.5 okay. uh, million. Um, and then the commissioner says we probably need another two to four million reductions. Uh, so if you think about that, um, if we're at five million acre feet, that's only a third of the water that we're used to getting in the lower basin, um, we would actually have for deliveries. So it's it's very significant. It's very okay. serious. You know, there's some hope that this year the water on the watershed will help temper that a, a little bit. Um, we really need five years of good water supply on the watershed to get through that. Um, so it is a it's a very serious issue. And right now the United States is in the process of developing a supplemental environmental impact statement to the original one that was done for the 2007 guidelines, just to look at all these alternatives and figure out how we're going to move forward. So thinking about, you know, tiers, obviously two is done, but three, it hasn't necessarily impacted daily life for most Arizona. It certainly impacted the ag community, which is significant it's, it's a huge we can't under under, under uh, estimate how big that is but tier three how would that start to impact business um, and daily life it's f- for those folks so the key to water resources in central arizona is to have a diverse portfolio right not to put all your eggs in one basket so if folks primarily depend on colorado river water it's significant right they they could um, lose technically all of their supply. Now, there's some discussion with the United States about um, developing human health and safety guidelines, meaning if it's a city and it's delivering to a home, you know, there's some other things that they're looking at which would push water a little bit out of priority. But really, the folks that are in the best shape are, are entities that have access to other surface water, which would be Salt River Project, groundwater. Um, you know, we have the Groundwater Management Act, so we're limited uh, essentially on on access to groundwater. But it's with all the water stored underground. You know, there's there's ways that we can maneuver our way through the system. 
uh, it's the folks that just have the one supply that are are going to be the most significantly impacted. So what can Arizona businesses and, and, and consumers do to impact this? Like, what kind of conservation measures really make a difference? Uh, so there's, there's uh, I, I feel like this is always what pushes us to innovation, right? Is when we get into these sorts of scenarios, we see the chips manufacturers and other technology moving away from water-cooled systems and move, moving in other directions. It's a hard place where we are right now. There's, I think there's some potential for some really good things to come out of it uh, as far as that goes. And, and there is some excellent technology right now uh, is in industrial um, conservation and and other programs. What about the the? I know I went, went to Israel a few years back, and uh, clearly desal is a big part of their strategy. But a bigger part of this is is, is reclaiming water. Yes. Um, and making it potable again. Didn't notice uh, over there. It's it's it. No, no one no one said a thing, and it, no one uh, no one got sick, and it was. <laughs> tasted fine. What about here in Arizona? I mean, is that something we should be thinking about? It is. And, you know, I actually had uh, the pleasure of going to Israel, too, about 10 years ago. And I feel like as you're driving around, you see the purple pipes in all the landscaping and they're irrigating their crops that way, too. Um, and they've really learned how to accommodate. We talk about opportunities to augment our supply. Yeah, I, I think that our first next best thing is effluent. It's a supply we have, we control, it's here. We are actually using a lot of effluent. Um, we're just using it in, we're not directly using it, right? We're not directly uh, reusing that water. We might be putting it in the river, delivering it to Palo Verde for their cooling water. You know, it's is part of the great. Trace Rio system. Yeah. It's, you know, there's, we've, we found innovative ways. I think today the cities, especially and the folks that are developing wastewater are looking a lot harder at what's the next step with that. And I, I think yeah. we need to. Well, and, and I think once people can see and understand that you're just getting H2O, that's it, mm -hmm. uh, then, then it's okay. And yes. and it certainly could go a long way in conservation and avoiding like a tier three and, and some of those other things that, that could that could come our way and, so we can continue to grow. Absolutely. In terms of generation, you, you mentioned some of the dams, water levels uh, coming down some. Um, what will be the impact on generation? So uh, a big part of the consideration in this supplemental EIS that the United States is looking at on the Colorado River is protecting infrastructure. And some of that, at least for a long time, is going to be protecting the ability to continue to generate electricity. You know, six million customers get power from Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, one of the biggest issues with Glen Canyon Dam, like Powell, is that they primarily, uh, their, their minimum uh, generation elevation is also their way to get water through the dam and to deliver it downstream. So it's not just power, it's the ability to get the water out of the dam and deliver it to the lower basin. So uh, in at Lake Mead, Hoover Dam, uh, the United States Bureau of Reclamation did a lot of work in anticipation of this and they um, installed low head turbines, meaning you don't need as much elevation to be able to generate power. And they uh, are able to generate at lower elevations, but, but still it'll be a fraction of what they can generate and what people are dependent on today. So, you know, we talk a lot about the water energy nexus and that's a perfect example. And speaking of sort of large projects, we have the bipartisan um, infrastructure bill that was just passed by Congress signed by the president. What sort of impacts might that have on our system? It's, you know, uh, we didn't talk about this before, but prior to coming to uh, Salt River Project, I spent 34 years at the Bureau of Reclamation. And so uh, I think that all of the funding that's been in the queue, $8 billion through the bipartisan infrastructure law, $4 billion more in the Inflation Reduction Act, that's really designated for drought and other water projects is is nearly unprecedented. So the fact that we have that kind of money is fantastic. The thing is, is 
we need projects. We need, and, and I think there weren't a lot of folks out there developing billion dollar projects or at the place where they could next necessarily spend a billion dollars on a project. So I think the United States is doing a great job of getting money out into the water community to help address these things. I think the best thing that we can do is support the local folks in getting projects ready, getting them on, you know, Absolutely. off the table and into into the field. Uh, it, speaking of sort of other um, uh, you know collaborations with states, other southwestern states or Mexico, any collaborations going on with uh, with those? There's uh, yes. players. There's always great collaboration. I know. I know. You know. Sometimes we're at odds, but we really are all in this together. Um, there's uh, a binational desal project that's been in the works for many years. Um, with Mexico is that would be a build on off of the agreements, the minutes that exist between the United States and Mexico for the delivery of Colorado River water. Um, it's it's a follow on to minute 319, which looked at other projects that the United States could do in Mexico to conserve water in the United States. So lots of really good collaboration there. Um, and and on those projects, it's not just Arizona, it's uh, Nevada and California that are working on those binational projects. We've also looked at projects with California, uh, where California could develop desal, and potentially there could be exchanges there, and um, you know better inland use. Uh, so lots and lots of projects in the queue. Again, um, these projects, you know, we we talked about the Central Arizona project. It it was planned in the '40s. It was authorized in the '60s, and it was constructed in the '80s. So. A lot of times these things, especially on these large scale, they they take time. It was a big lead time. Yeah. And you know, that consensus building process is really important. Well, so we we've kind of we've covered a lot of ground and certainly there is there are challenges. We've done a lot up to this point to ensure that we're meeting those challenges. We're doing we're going to do more. Thinking about businesses coming into Arizona, is this still a place where um, companies should come? and look to set up headquarters and and create jobs given this um, shortage and the mitigation measures that we've put in place? Absolutely. I think Arizona has a, a great history of, you know, one of the first reclamation projects was here. One of the most recent reclamation projects were here. Um, we had one of the first groundwater management acts. We, we've always been, the, the governor is reconvening the governor's water policy council to relook at groundwater management. I feel like we've always been, we have really smart people here working on water and we've always been on the cutting edge. Clearly, any industry that's going to come here needs to to understand the lay of the land and where we are and what that means. But uh, I think that there's that there's no other state, no other community that's done the kind of work and developed that reliable, uh, renewable sources of water like we have in Arizona. So it sounds like you're bullish on Arizona. I am. I am. Yes. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Well, I want to thank you for spending so much time with us and and also the, the work of, of a, a career in ensuring that we have uh, the, the infrastructure and now the water going forward. Now, since we are talking water today, we're going to do a, um, a lightning round. We're going to do a water themed lightning round. <laughs> very quick, very easy. Don't worry. There's not really a wrong answer. Okay. Preference. Tap filtered or bottled water what do you drink i drink tap water okay i do there you go i like it um i'm sure the mayor's gonna love to hear that <laughs> um in terms of where you'd rather spend some time the ocean a river or a pool a river okay mm. excellent um and then we'll go to first job i think you kind of covered this but let's maybe there was a first job in the teenage so, years first job and right so uh, i will tell you my first real paying job was at morrow's nut house yeah, I made candy and <laughs> sold nuts over the counter. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> What'd you learn? I learned that I love nuts and I would fill my pockets with them so I could snack on them when uh, in between customers. Well, at least it's healthy, right? <laughs> uh, okay, and and obviously you have a phenomenal job now. But what's the dream job? If you could have any job in the world, <sighs> any job in the world. You know, I I hate to say this, but. Um, 
I wouldn't change a thing. This is my dream job. When I was in college, I remember wanting to, well, when I grew up, I grew up in California and we spent all of our vacations camping and boating at all the reclamation projects, which I didn't know were reclamation projects at the time. Um, but once I went to college and uh, in my engineering curriculum, all I ever wanted to do was work in water. Um, and I, you know, how you look back as your children grow and you advise them and I, I wouldn't do anything different. I, I feel very fortunate to be at Salt River Project, exactly where I am now, um, mentoring young people, getting the next generation ready. Uh, it's a great gig. Well, we normally don't allow that answer, but <laughs> I, I, I believe you. I think I think that you're a hundred percent honest in this, and that is your your dream job. So, it is. thank you for spending so much time with us. We appreciate it, and hopefully, we can have you again soon. And and hopefully, we'll have some more to talk about, more water, uh, more good news. Thanks, Todd. Thank you.